Hello everyone. The single board computer Orange V5 Plus has arrived. I ordered it because I needed a compact and powerful ground station for the FTV system OpenIPC. You might be wondering why I chose this particular single board computer. The thing is, I initially considered a TV box for the ground station. These are budget TV boxes that contain 1GB of RAM. The processor allows for the decoding of high resolution video and you can install Linux and a Wi-Fi broadcast system on it. They are available with various processors, including the Hawk chip RK3229, RK3128, and others. For example, the RK3229 has four Cortex, A7 cores with a frequency of up to 1.5 GHz, and features an HDMI output that allows for connection to a 4K screen at 50 Hz. You can encode video streams in H.264, H.265 and VP9 with a resolution of up to 4K and a frame rate of up to 60 FPS. There are both cheap and expensive set-top boxes. In addition, I have looked at an IP camera with the ROG chip RV1126 processor, which contains a neural sub-processor, allowing for the use of machine learning for object recognition. And I want to modify this camera for the FPV system. But to do this, I need to understand how the ROC chip is structured and what software and drivers are available. Since a single board computer Orange P was released on the ROC chip with accessible and detailed documentation, the choice fell on it. It has a complete set, the ability to work with SPI flash, EMMC, SD card, NVMD, and USB flash storage. The top tier chip RK3588 is installed as the processor. There is also one HDMI output and two additional outputs, which will allow for the connection of an external camera. There are outputs available for connecting a touchscreen and the possibility to connect an expansion board for cameras. Overall, it seems that the Orange V5 Plus was created for neural network developers because the processor contains a neural coprocessor with six teraflops. And there is the possibility to install high speed EMMC and NVMe storage devices for storing and processing large volumes of data. Two high-speed network interfaces of 2.5 GBPS each will allow multiple Orange V5 Plus devices to be combined into a powerful cluster, while the sixth generation Wi-Fi interface will provide high-speed access to the internet. The Orange 5 Plus comes with 16 gigabytes of LDDR4 memory. I chose the 16 gigabyte version so that it would still be sufficient for productive work in a couple of years. I also considered between the Orange 5 and the Orange 5 Plus, but the former has limited external interfaces, meaning you can connect less external equipment. Check the comparison table between the Orange 5 and the Orange 5 Plus. The trimmed version has fewer USB ports. One HDMI output instead of two, one IP line instead of two, this means one less full camera. PCI Express 3 is absent. There are two PCI Express 2 lines instead of three, and so on. Otherwise, the same cause and performance. Next, we move on to the choice of operating system. For Wi-Fi brute force attacks, Linux is required. Therefore, the Android system is automatically R ruled out. From Linux, there is the option of ARMBine and Orange OS. I thought I would first install the operating system offered by the developer. But if there are problems, I will switch to Armbine and see how stability is there. I will install it on the EMMC storage. This is how it looks on the board. Usually, such devices are used in communicators. Oh, I mean in smartphones. It is the same as an SD card, but in the chip form factor that is soldered onto the board. I download the operating system image from the Orange Pi website. I go to the device, select my single board computer, then go to Downloads and choose the Orange Pi OS. I am redirected to Google Drive and download it from there. It is also necessary to download the driver and utility for flashing the image. I go to the appropriate section and download the folder. Next, I will unzip the utilities and the operating system image. Unpacking the file takes a lot of time, so I sped it up in the editing. Then, I go to the folder with the utilities, 
Inside, there is the RK DevTools driver and program. This is analogous to the burn utility from the previous video, similar to how Linux is used on an IP in camera. I install the driver so that the computer can recognize the orange pie in the device manager. Then I launch the RK DevTools utility. As you can see, everything here is in Chinese, but this can be fixed by changing the selected parameter to 2. I save and restart the program. Now we have the interface in English. I connect the single board computer via a USB cable, hold down the button, and connect the power. The single board computer is identified as a rock USB device. Next, I right click to select the configuration file for working with the EMMC storage. Then, in the first line, I choose the mini loader or bootloader. And in the second line, I select the operating system image that I will be flashing onto our storage device. Here, I shorten the file name so that the program displays the writing status. Done. Now I check the box and click Run. The writing process takes up to 5 minutes. After rebooting, there may be a boot issue. To fix this, it is necessary to clear the contents of the SPI. Flash memory. This is a small chip on the board. It contains an outdated bootloader, and the processor tries to boot from it. The operating system booted quite quickly from the EMMC storage. But I immediately didn't like that there is no program for working with the AppGate and U packages that I am used to. But let's move on to testing the video. I go to YouTube and play the video Avatar 2. I expand the video to full screen and set the resolution to 4K. I also enable statistics for the video stream. As can be seen, the video is being played using the VP09 codec. This is a Google codec. It is also evident that there are stutters. I open the CPU monitoring program and see that it is loaded to 100%. This means that the hardware codec is not enabled by default, and it will be necessary to tinker with its installation. But I have no desire to deal with this right now. Therefore, I am installing a different image from those offered on the Orange Pi website. I am downloading with the GNOME graphical interface, but you can also download any other version. I will unzip the image in the current folder and give it a short name, for example, Ubuntu. I then similarly write it to the EMMC storage. The system successfully booted, and the standard Ubuntu interface called Unity opened. I immediately open YouTube avatar at 50 pps to check the system for lag. I enable statistics and 4K mode. As can be seen, there are no lags, but YouTube served a video with the AV01 codec. If you remember, in another system this video was played with a different codec, VP09. This may be related to the absence of lags in this operating system. If you look at the CPU load, you can see that it is used at less than 50%. This indicates the use of hardware decoding. I also noticed that at certain resolutions, the codec outputs a green screen instead of an image. For example, at 240p and 480p. At other resolutions, the codec works correctly. Let's try switching to 8K mode at 60 frames per second. In this mode, we still have the AV01 codec and we can observe lags and freezes. It is evident that the codec is struggling, resulting in frame drops, even though the CPU cores are loaded at around 50%. Let's check the CPU temperature again. It is 71.2 degrees. And this is without any cooling. That's all well and good. But it's time to move on to decoding video from the IP camera. First, Let's install all the necessary components. To do this, I created a step-by-step -step guide. It can be viewed in the OpenIPC repository or in my GIF repository. I sequentially copy commands from each block into the terminal. First, I will need to update the operating system using the update and ungrade commands. And you can immediately follow the link to Google Drive and download the header files for the rock chip RK3588 kernel. Next, we will unpack the files into the current folder. We will check if we have all the files, and in the console, I will 
also navigate here using the command cd. This is necessary to make it easier to execute the following commands from the instructions. I am preparing to install the kernel header files. They will be needed to compile the driver for the Wi-Fi adapter. The following command prohibits the loading of any standard drivers for RTL 8012 AU chips. We need drivers specifically prepared for our FPV system. Right now, they are being compiled and installed. After this procedure is completed, I use the NMC command to find the name of the Wi-Fi adapter and the connected driver. In this case, the standard driver is installed, so it is necessary to reboot the system to load the newly installed drivers. Now the driver name has the ending, WFD, which is what we need. Now we install VFB ANJ. I copy the block entirely and replace the VLAN parameter with the name of the Wi-Fi adapter. I run it. With the next command, I enable the Wi-Fi broadcast after rebooting the operating system. Then I check the set Wi-Fi channel. I have 151. Now I need to copy the secret key from the camera to the workstation. For this, I will use the SCP command, specifying the network address of the camera as the IP address. That's it. Now all that's left is to restart the Wi-Fi broadcast service and it can be used. To check if everything is working, there is a special utility called VFB CLI. I launch it, and as you can see, the data is being transmitted. And the final touch will be the launch of the video decoding program called GStreamer. I am starting to encode using the H265 codec. As can be seen, the installation process involves simply copying commands from the instructions. I wonder what the latency will be with the Orange P5 single board computer. I measure, and it turns out that the latency values range from 130 to 160 milliseconds. That's quite a lot compared to what I measured last time. As it turned out, the monitor's refresh rate was set to 60 Hz. Now I have set it to 144 Hz and will try to measure the latency again. The latency was 98, 139 ms. The lower value improved by 30 minutes, while the upper value slightly worsened. I will try to connect the camera via a cable. In this case, the latency ranges from 66 to 99 minutes. That is, the lower value decreases by another 30 minutes. It turns out that the Wi-Fi broadcast introduces a delay of 30 milliseconds, although the developers claim it is 5 milliseconds. This needs to be looked into. He also measured the latency at different monitor refresh rates, 60 hertz and 120 hertz. I also measured on another monitor, but the results there are slightly different. For example, here is the latency for 25 hertz. Here is a summary table. Pause and study it. I found an interesting case on Tindiverse. There are two options, a closed version and an open version. I chose an open design so that it would be easy to access the device's peripherals. My main concern is to avoid accidentally knocking anything off the board while connecting the connectors. Later he may print a second version of the case. To power the orange P from a battery, it is also necessary to use a voltage converter. I bought a cheap DC-DC on AliExpress, soldered a power USB cable to it, and modified the case for the USB connector. It consists of two parts that are joined together and secured with glue or tape. Using two resistors I set 5 volts and 3 amps. I know that this converter can operate without heating. The current is up to 2 amps, but I set it to 3 amps. Note that this will only be for a short time. I connect to the fuel tank using a standard connector and a Vishnura, but in general, it can also be connected directly to the board. Currently, a 3's battery is connected, and I see if it will start. The LED blinked, which means everything is working. To protect the camera from external influences, I designed and printed a case made of two parts. I was inspired by another model from the printable website, but I didn't like that it had too many screws, so I decided to create my own version. The installation process is quite simple. I remove the lens, install the camera in the case, and then return the lens to its original position. 
I found a non-working USB charger and desoldered the connector to use it in the project. I have already soldered four wires and secured them with hot glue. Now I am soldering the wires to the board according to the schematic. Red is positive, black is negative, and there are two signal wires. The camera is powered by 12 volts. This voltage is supplied to a 2 amp converter 6A8D. And after the inductance, we get 5 volts, which power the entire camera, including the USB port, where the Wi Fi adapter is connected. Therefore, I am soldering a more powerful 5 volt back here. I am finally assembling the structure into the case. Here, I pull out the power wires and insert the USB connector into its place. To prevent the USB connector from wobbling, I secure it with hot glue. The cover of the case has special latches for securing it. I close it and latch it with a light press. Look at how the design turned out. You can insert a Wi-Fi module into the USB port or connect it through a special as extender. So, the 3's battery powers the orange P through a 5 volt back and the Hakka Ref is powered by the orange P. I use this large battery to power the screen. Here is the screen. Everything is powered, but we still need a keyboard and mouse for now. I think over time we will get rid of that and switch to a remote control. Overall, that's it. FPV goggles can also be connected. We are ready for the test flight. How's the flight? Is it a pesh colette? In general, I am sitting here, and Artem went to the other side of the quarry. The quarry is about one kilometer long. Here is the picture itself, and I also connected it as an RF spectrum analyzer. Here you can see the frequency. That's it, connection lost. Here it is now. Yes, I saw the grave, but in short, there is practically no connection. So, the brake with the brakes, Vova, apparently, direct visibility should be there. Now I can see you, and the connection has appeared. In general, when Artem went behind the tree, the connection was lost and did not return. When he came out, here to the very farthest point, the connection did not appear, but it's unclear whether it simply doesn't catch the signal or if something happened and the camera isn't working. Now Artem is going back. Let's see if he will catch it again right here, near the tree. Where is Artem? At this distance, the reception is quite good. I honestly say that. I did not expect such a result. Only when I reviewed the footage did I notice that the communication problem had been there from the very beginning. The picture was glitching and breaking into cubes, although everything worked smoothly at home. Therefore, it is necessary to conduct repeat range tests. That's all for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Goodbye everyone.